I wonder if my team could come, uh, June and Daniel, and we just want to introduce ourselves. As we begin, we will be the facilitators for for these uh, days together, and uh, so I'd like to introduce Daniel Holmquist, president of Church Assistance Ministry, and uh, right. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here. I'm from uh, Los Angeles, California. And I've been a pastor for 25 years. And in the last six years, I've been involved in training pastors and church planters around the world, uh, primarily in Asian context. And so uh, how much do you want me to share this evening? Just a little bit, my history. Okay. All right. So uh, Church Assistance Ministry, if you're not familiar with our organization, is a, is a group of 13 uh, pastors, uh, former pastors like the three of us. And, uh, and we do all sorts of leadership development, consulting, and training um, for churches, a uh, variety of needs that we all face. And so we're very glad to be here. Um, I'll share a lot of stories probably tomorrow when I'm doing a lot of my teaching, but uh, let me just tell you one story. Um, I've been a pastor, I pastored a church called uh, the Lancaster Evangelical Free Church for 12 years. When I started there, the church was in serious decline. It had been a church of about 200 people at one point. The pastor moved on uh, for good reasons to another church, but they were, not, were, were without a pastor for about two years before the Lord led me to them and them to me. But in that time, they declined from 200 to 100 to 50 to 25, and there was basically very few families left. And they didn't know what to do. Should they continue? Should they close the church? Should they even bother looking for another pastor? And so it was a very discouraging place for them. You know, they had a lot of programs when they were a church of 200 people. They had a vibrant children's ministry in the middle of the week. They had a lot of ladies' Bible studies, men's Bible studies, outreach programs, all those things that uh, many people look for in a church. So when I came to the church, it was uh, what we call in America a restart church or replanting of the church or a church that's in need of revitalization, those types of things. I, from what I understand, those are some of the struggles that are common to a lot of churches around the world. And so one of the things that we did right away is I had found out that the church had, because it was declining, started to find its identity in a very, very specific theology. And so because, in other words, their ministries were disappearing, their reasons for existence now started to become identifying with a very narrow theological viewpoint. And that was their identity. And that's where they found their hope. That's where they found their reason for existence. But of course, it wasn't appealing to anyone but themselves. And so the church just continued to shrink and to look inward. And so one of the very first things I had to do in revitalizing this church was to get rid of this narrow theology and to help them to understand how um, evangelicalism is a broad understanding of the gospel and what this really means for people. So it took a lot of teaching initially to help them understand really what the Bible teaches. You know, not what their theology books are teaching them, even though they may be right or good. But what does the Bible really teach? Who is Jesus? What is the gospel? Why is it the hope for the world? What are we here for? You know, what is God's vision for our church? And so I did a lot of teaching. And right away, I told them, we should be planting churches. And they looked around at each other and they said, there's only like 25 of us. Since you came, a few people came because, you know, the new pastor's in town and everybody's got to check him out. So, uh, so now we're up to like, you know, 30, 40 people. And I said, this is the perfect size to start planting churches. And they thought I was crazy. It's like, we don't have enough people. We don't have enough money, you know, and they certainly didn't have a vision. 
And so, but I did that on purpose because I wanted to expand the way they thought about church. What is the church? You know, what is Jesus' great commission to make disciples of all peoples? And what's our part in it as a church? And so I just started teaching through uh, the book of Acts. I started teaching them theology and what the implications are. That it's not just to fill your head with knowledge. It's so that you can share it with the world. So that people can be saved. And so that the mission could continue. And so the first people I started to work with were my leaders, uh, our elders. They were actually a very good, solid group of men who loved the, loved the Lord deeply, loved the word, and were very obedient and humble men, really. And you don't always get that kind of a group of people, people to work with. In fact, the whole church was really that way. It's just that they didn't know where to go. No one was there to lead them. And so... Uh, make a long, long story short, um, we turned this church around in under two years. And so right away, after we got the teaching part um, going, I took the elders to training, like the one you're in today, actually, very similar, on how to plant churches. I just took my leaders there and said, let's go learn how to plant churches. And uh, we'll see what God does. And maybe he'll lead us to church plant, plant churches, maybe he won't. We don't really know. And so, but we did, we went to these church planning seminars and conferences together, and they started to get a bigger vision for what the church could really do. In fact, what a small church could do. And uh, at least in America, small churches often have this complex that they can't do much because they're small. And it's all the big churches and the celebrity pastors that, uh, that get all the attention. And those are the ones, those are the people, those are the churches that can do significant things. But I was convinced that uh, God's people, all they need to know is the word of God and they need to get out in the world and they need to share the gospel and God's going to do amazing things. And so, so after all of our training uh, in church planting and we're starting to think about what to do next, um, I did something very unusual in leading this church. And uh, it's not what we're going to actually talk about here specifically tonight, but I said, let's just find the hardest place in the world. To plant churches and let's start there because most people most people i know most pastors i know always want to start where they are located so we 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 looked around the world we eventually found uh, some really really difficult places and we started planting churches there and the reason was is because if we could do it there well then it'd be really easy to do it in our own context because it was really strange they were afraid of their own community they didn't they didn't have non-christian friends in the community for some reason I didn't understand why. And, but it was much easier for them to share the gospel with people they didn't know. So I said, all right, well, let's start there. So I uh, eventually, it's a long story again, but we ended up in a place finally um, in southwest China, near the North Vietnam border, among unreached people groups that were untargeted, that no one had shared the gospel with. And so I figured, let's start there. That would be awesome if we could be the first ones in to share the gospel and plant churches. And we had no idea how to do it. And so, uh, but we did it anyway. And so we just went over there, started taking teams over there to plant churches. And, uh, and our strategy um, was basically uh, to find young university students who were bilingual, could speak English and could speak Chinese, and the local dialects that we were interested in targeting. And we just became friends with them. And uh, some of them weren't even Christians. But we said, that's fine. All you got to do is translate the gospel for us. And many of them became Christians through that process on the very first trip. And so <clears throat> over the series of time, we ended up training about <clears throat> a couple dozen young university men and women who were brand new Christians, or they were already Christians, they were very young in their faith, but they had no vision for church planting either. They just went to the local Chinese church, underground church, state church, whatever it was, and, uh, and they just did church. But they had no vision for reaching people around them, even in their own communities or in the villages that had never heard the gospel and were worshiping, they were animists and Buddhists and worshiping all sorts of interesting things. But, um, but what we were really doing over time was training church planters. They didn't know they were being trained as church planters. But that was the strategy. Because the best way to learn to do evangelism and church planting is to actually do it. Um, and that's even more effective 
and then sitting down often and learning about it. And so we would take them out, do evangelism, plant churches. We had a very interesting strategy. It worked. Um, over the course of six years, we planted 24 churches and uh, in villages and in the city. And uh, I want to save, save time for you guys to share your story, so I'll wrap it up here. But, um, but over those, those years, from 2006 to about 2011, um, together with this group of young Chinese men and women who had now been trained as church planters and graduated from university, many of them working in the community, but they were committed to planting churches on a missional church planting model. Um, we would gotten 24 churches started over the course of uh, time. A number of them didn't succeed, and that's fine, but many of them did succeed. And the gospel and churches had been established in communities that had never heard the gospel before. And even today, I spend time going over there and I coach. Uh, some of you have been introduced to coaching leaders and coaching church planners. I coach a couple of these uh, Chinese pastors uh, by Skype, and I also advise their church planning movement. And so this now, all these little small groups of university students in the main city that had come to Christ and been discipled and going through this process got together and formed a real church in their mind. And it was a church of 300 people and uh, in two different locations. And they're very active in sharing the gospel in the city. And they're starting to develop a renewed heart for the villages and what it's going to take to get out there and plant those churches. So to sort of come back around to the story, and I can share more details with you personally if you're interested in the story, but uh, then the people in my church that had gone over there to assist the other church in their vision in China, we probably had three quarters of our people, 75% of our church had gone over to China to do evangelism and church planting. And they changed as people. And so now they weren't afraid of their neighbors anymore. They were sort of embarrassed and surprised that they were in the past. They were so excited about sharing the gospel with people that you didn't have to train them anymore. They just would naturally share the gospel with people. And so we started seeing people come to Christ um, at a little higher level than we had before, being a part of our church. And then when we looked around the community and we thought, well, what kind of a church should we plant next? We decided we would start a Spanish-speaking church. And so we were able to locate um, a Spanish-speaking pastor, um, who was trained according to the model that we're going to be training you in. And, uh, and in partnership with another church, um, so sort of like two mother churches, we got, we got together and we established a Spanish-speaking church in our own community and the church planning vision for our valley, our community, uh, just started to grow from there. And so that's part of my story. I'm very excited to be here with you. Um, this afternoon, um, the three of us had a great time um, with, uh, with your president, Stefan, and with Tamash and Tamash and many of the other men, just hearing about God's blessing upon your efforts to revitalize your churches in Slovakia, to plant new churches in Slovakia. And uh, as Steve and I in June were talking over it, we're just uh, uh, sort of awestruck that God has really blessed your faithfulness. And we are really excited to be with you and to share the material we have on basic church planting training and excited to learn from you as well. About how um, how we can work together um, to see God's kingdom advance in this country as well. So thank you, and uh, I'll give it over to you, Steve. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, this is June Sabate. Uh, we're partners in many ways in church planting uh, ministry. So June, I'd just like you to introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. It's nice to be here. First time for me to be in Central Europe. Anyway. My name is June Sabate. Uh, June is short for junior, but my real name is Celestino. But you don't call me Celestino. But it's an ugly name. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I've been a pastor for 32 years, uh, two years uh, uh, teaching in the seminary, uh, professor especially in church history. Uh, I was a pastor in the Philippines for 10 years, migrated to the States. I've been pastor for 19 years now uh, in the States. Uh, we planted our first church in 1999. We started with zero. We, my wife and I and my family moved to this city, and then we started to just approach people if they would like to become part of a church. And so that's how we started. And that church has been pastoring for, for 
the last uh, 18 years. Um, our focus is church planting. And so uh, Steve is my mentor for 17, 18 years now, actually from the beginning. So, And his joy and his influence in my life is to plant churches. By the way, when we say church plant, my passion is discipleship. The methodology in discipling people is planting churches. Planting churches is not the end. It is the means so that we can disciple people. Okay, so just like that to be, this, uh, I, I will say this is the churches that we have planted, but our joy is to see people coming to know Jesus Christ and they become passionate followers of Jesus. That is my passion. And that's what I would like to see in, in our ministry. And so we started the church uh, and, and he always reminds us we need to plant the church. We, we have expression, uh, you must be born pregnant. So before we started the church to have public worship, we were thinking already how we can plant the next church. And we don't have any idea, of course, how to do that. But we like the idea of just planting a church because if you cannot plant the ch within uh, three years, it's harder. So you plant the church, let, let's, say, let's say 2017, uh, it is good to plant the church in the next, like, year 2020 because it, it, it becomes a culture in your church so it took us actually three years to plant our first church it took us another two years to plant the second church it took us one church uh, one year to plant our third church and and that that and then we stopped okay, we stopped counting uh, because uh, for us multiplication is not one church becoming church but one church becoming four at least four that is multiplication. And, and, and that is one thing that we will be sharing with you, teaching with you. Do not think addition, you think multiplication. Okay? Do not think addition that one church becoming, I know that's 100% increase, but that is not multiplication. One church becoming at least four churches, that is multiplication. And that is becoming a culture in your church. And so that is ingrained in, in every church. In every church planter that I am recruiting, I will say, you are going to plant, not a church but you are going to plant many churches that that is the deal and that is always the front end when we when we recruit church planters and we'll say and of course they will say how can I do that I never even planted one church and you want me to plant four churches it's by God's grace don't, don't worry about it but I'd like for you to think differently I'd like for you to approach it in the sense that uh, I, I love our last plan. The, the, the church planter came up their first Sunday and said, this is, this is brother so-and-so. Next year, he's going to plant the church. But he's going internship in our church today. I love that. I love that. We don't have church yet, and yet we're thinking that we're going to multiply and by God's grace. That's what we have done. And so now we have about 30 churches and 12 church plants. And, and many, and as, as Daniel said, many died along the way, but many also flourished, uh, uh, both in California, in the Philippines, as well as in Japan. In Japan, so my, my sister is married to a Japanese national, and so I visited her one time. I, grew, I met this group of men, people uh, who are Filipinos in Japan, and I said, why don't we start the church? And so, so we started the church. So we have four churches now there. And it's so nice because they're reaching their Japanese husband, the, the Filipinas. Uh, and, and they're being, you know how hard it is to reach the Japanese. Japan is unreached as far as mission is concerned because they have less than 1% Christian, and that including Catholic, uh, Protestant, and, and other things. But they are less than 1%. And so for us to see Japanese men being baptized, we really are rejoicing because uh, that is uh, that is hard. So, uh, in the next few days with you, we'll be sharing our stories and you will be sharing our heart. Uh, we'll not tell you how to plant the church here because we never planted the church here. Uh, but I hope you will get the principles and, and, and not the things that we do, but the principle of specially discipling people and multiplying, not churches, because I'd rather have three healthy churches than 20 unhealthy churches. You hear me? I rather have three healthy churches because those three churches, healthy churches, will definitely will produce. And rather than us uh, solving many problems in the church and healthy churches. So from, from the very beginning, you aim for a healthy church that will multiply. So again, it's nice to, to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I know we're going to have uh, much fun today.
When I finished seminary, when I finished seminary, uh, I had a thought in my head that came through a conversation with a fellow graduate. And that idea was, why don't we go and start a church somewhere where there is a need for a church? And, and that was the first conversation about church planting I ever had in seminary. I went there for four years. About five years later, I had pastored a church. Uh, the idea with that man died uh, because of some circumstances. But I, uh, I got a call from a district leader in the Evangelical Free Church of America. And he said, uh, Steve, have you, ever, have you ever thought about starting a church? And I said, thought to myself, yes, yes, I am. And I remembered that conversation. And it was like a little, uh, uh, a little spark burst into flame in my head. And I thought, Maybe, maybe God will let me do that. And I began a journey at that time that has been uh, amazing. The best thing has been that new churches have been started. And we have found that it is true what it says in the books, that the best way to reach new people with the gospel of Jesus Christ is to plant new churches. So I planted one. My wife and I and my daughter and my son helped. Uh, they were just very young children when we started. But uh, we were able to see in a small community, it was about uh, 1,200 people. Uh, we were able to see maybe 150 people come to know Jesus Christ. And a little church was built there. And my heart was forever changed. I went to uh, another city and was able to start another one. But the thing that has transformed my life is the concept that we need to start new churches. I was a church planting leader for the denomination and we were starting some churches. But one day I realized as I looked back over the recent history before I came on into church planting leadership that only one of the last eight church plants in our district in California succeeded. There was a newsletter proudly talking about those church plants written a few years before. But three years later, only one of them existed. And I realized, along with some of the other leaders, that we were not knowing how to do it. It is a disaster. Well, I mean, they talked about failures. I don't like failures. They do happen along the way. But when a church starts with great passion and enthusiasm for Jesus Christ and the desire to reach a community or a part of a city with the gospel, and then it dies, it causes great pain and great uh, spiritual uh, hurt is done to the people who have to now uh, admit that it didn't work. And some people, I have found, leave the faith or they become Christians who never again want to risk anything. 
And so um, we got together in the United States in the Evangelical Free Church and we started meeting together and saying, what can we do about that? And what we were able through talking to other people who were more successful than we were, we were able to find that there was a way to do that. And that way is that we needed to support church planters with some specific kinds of ministries that we had not done before. The first support system that we developed was a training system. We called it Church Planters Boot Camp. And it was a training event similar to this. And we found that when we trained people with the process of church planting, not how to make, to build a certain kind of church, but the process you need to go through to have an effective church, um, we started to have more successes. And then we realized that some of the people that were leading the church plants, the church planting pastors, were not really able to do it very well. When they got into the middle of it, they were ineffective. And so we started to come up with a plan. Other people had done this, so we borrowed some ideas from them and developed a system of assessment so we could assess church planters before they ever went out. And we could figure out a way to affirm them before they planted a church and sometimes to say no to people who were gifted differently who had personalities and gifts that were not uh, the kind that usually worked according to the research that had been done. And we found that applying assessment to the process before we trained people and deployed people worked really well. And then we realized that when we sent people out to places to plant churches, very often they felt like they were alone. And uh, when I went out the first time to plant a church, um, this is kind of the message that I got. These aren't the words, but the, it was the message. And that is, Steve, plant a church. And I essentially asked, what is, what is the, what does that mean? What do I do? And the, the leader said, well, you're a pastor. Just pastor them. They're a real little group, but just pastor the little group and it'll grow. That was my training. There were no seminars. There, was, there were no books that I could find on how to do it. And I just went out. The church plant that we started in that little community was the one out of the eight that survived. That wasn't because I was such a great person, but I happened to have the right set of gifts, and uh, I was the kind of person that could do that. When we decided that instead of just sending people out and saying, if you have any problems, give me a call, we would establish a system where somebody would walk with that church planter through the experience of planting a church for at least a couple of years. And we call them a church planting coach. And that church planting coach was trained on how to be a good coach. Some of you have been through the training that I've done on that here. And, uh, and, and so the, no longer were they having to try to figure out the whole process by themselves. They were able to have somebody walk with them, remind them of important things, ask them the right questions, 
and keep the people on track in the development of the church plant and not forget important things. Assessment, basic training, and coaching form the ABCs of a system. And here's the effect of it. What happened was that we were succeeding not just one out of eight overall, but about uh, uh, 25 or 30 percent of the time we were having a successful church plan. After we did the got the ABCs in operation and were working with those for a few years, we realized that about 80 percent of our church plants were effective and successful. And so that's why I have spent the rest of my life sharing these things with people in various countries. So uh, I'm here and I'm very glad to talk about these things with you and to see how it works in Slovakia. So we're going to uh, there's one other thing one other thing that is important that is that in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. None of us in this room build the church of Jesus Christ. We walk with him and he uses us in the process, but it's his church. So we need to keep that in mind as we go through. Is there something, a secret to making this move forward? trying. Okay. You have before you a manual, and I didn't get one up here myself, but you have a manual, and the whole first uh, part of the book are the slides. So as the slides go by, you will be able to take notes in the lines beside the slides. And uh, so that will be the part of the process. Um, in the back of the book, you'll notice that there is our pages that look more like worksheets. And we will be referring to those worksheets and using them as we go along. The the, uh, the book is designed to give you a, a sequence of um, development parts that you have to deal with, and it will lay them out in kind of a chronological order in the development of a church plant over the first two years of the process. You know what I would like for us to do, June, is have you run this one, because I have to run this one, and I'm not going to co coordinate very well. So now it will be the first part of our seminar will be the preparation part and we're going to be spending some time talking about making sure that before you at least i hope that before you plant a church and begin the project of doing that that uh, you go through a preparation process before there they do their projects or jobs a farmer prepares the field for the crop that is being planted. That'd be fine if there was a place that I won't spill it. Okay, thank you. 
uh, a builder uh, goes through all of the planning and blueprints and so forth. Uh, if a, if a army is going to succeed in battle, uh, the, the leader, the general, uh, prepares very well. Uh, before an athletic coach uh, uh, leads his team into the, uh, the contest of uh, sports, uh, he has to prepare the people. And so we need to prepare fully also to plant a church. Our theme verse for this opening part is this. For who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates? Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough? Uh, and Jesus gives us an important principle of preparation. The problem is that inadequate Preparation produces a weak foundation, which results in a healthy, unhealthy church plant, which results in many church planting failures. The people who were assigned to plant churches when I first started in this uh, church planting uh, experience were not prepared. They uh, therefore experienced the uh, failures that were so uh, devastating to so many lives. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about the principles of church planting. And the most important thing that will underlie this is that we need to recruit uh, prayer support. Maybe you have, but we need to have people praying for us. Before we left uh, our homes, we recruited uh, a large number of people to be praying for this seminar. Um, so these intense days of training are some of the most strategic days of what will maybe eventually be your church planting experience. And for some of you, you're already planning to plant a church. If you're not, Yet certain about planting a church, you still need uh, intense prayer during this time. Because as we start talking about the Lord um, using us to invade the territory that Satan thinks he owns, uh, there's going to be spiritual warfare. There's going to be spiritual battles. And so much prayer is needed. So I'm going to suggest something before we go to this next slide. If you would um, text two or three people that do not know what you're doing, and or maybe they do know what you're doing, but ask them to be praying over the next uh, through Monday uh, for this seminar for you, that would be a great additional prayer force to support us as we're going through the next few days. So I'm going to ask you to do that at a break um, and you'll have, a, you'll have time to do that. I think all of us could think of a few people that we could text and let them know that uh, we need their help. Um, our church planting vision, this was developed by by us when we were first starting, we were thinking, what do we want to see accomplished? And I've put the word Slovakia in here instead of the uh, America, but otherwise this statement is the same. Our vision is to bring pleasure to God by using proactive servant leadership to mobilize the church planting movement throughout Slovakia, where every church will ultimately become a reproducing church and no church planter will be left alone. No church planter will be left alone 
because there will be somebody who will have as a responsibility to be a coach trained to help church planters succeed. One of the worst things about this process is when we have to do it by ourselves. Now, it's not by ourselves, but the leadership is by ourselves. And sometimes that leadership can be very, very lonely, especially if others uh, are not a, aware of how to help us. Our values are to be faithful to the scriptural teachings about the church. And we will be talking about those scriptural teachings as we go through. Uh, we need to be dependent upon God's Holy Spirit through the entire process of uh, church planting. We're talking about the centrality of disciple making and evangelism. One of the problems of the weakness of the American church in the early 21st century is that we are not a disciple making church by and large. Most of our churches, when I get bring, uh, as I often do, the challenge to become a church in which people uh, the, 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 the people of the church take a responsibility to develop relationships up with other people that will enhance the probability of their spiritual growth and will enable them to more effectively enter into uh, the ministry of the church and equip them for that. Uh, I get blank stares from people often. They, they know that the Bible teaches about disciple-making, but they do not know how to do it. I met with an elder team uh, a few years ago, and I was um, challenging them. They, 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 the assignment was to, to uh, help them uh, become ready to plant a church. But when I began to talk with them, I realized that there was no consensus about doing that. So I changed my strategy and I said, well, the thing that you need to do is to follow Jesus' command in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And you do that, you make disciples, not just by preaching sermons and having Bible studies, but having relationships in which people teach and encourage one another and help each other become faithful in their Christian experience. Uh, one of the elders looked at me with a... Um, with a kind of a funny look on his face. And he said, we know that the Bible teaches that, Jesus taught that, but we don't do that in our church. And I just had a thought in my head about that. And I said, I can't imagine that people who know the commission of the Lord that what it's all about is making disciples of people and who are not doing it, why they aren't falling down on their faces before the Lord and crying out to the Lord if they don't know what to do, crying out to the Lord, help us to figure this out. This is central to what you have taught us to do, told us to do, and we're not doing it. Lord, help us. We will not stop asking until you start to give us insight in how to develop relational ministries that build people up, that uh, help people to grow to maturity, that fulfill the words of the Apostle Paul, in Colossians chapter 1, that we might present everyone 
complete in Christ. That's what he said he labored for. I labor for this. For this purpose, I labor, striving according to all of his power, which mightily works within me. And you're saying that we don't make disciples here. That's amazing. I wasn't asked back. <laughs> that was the last time I met with that board. Uh, so the training schedule that we will be in in the next uh, uh, three days after today is first we're talking about the preparation of the planter. Second, we'll talk about the conception stage of church planting. We use the birth analogy of conception, prenatal development, and birth and growth uh, as we talk about the process of planting churches. So we're going to spend a lot of time tomorrow talking, uh, at least by tomorrow afternoon, talking about the conception phase phase of church planting, which is the development of understanding that is shared by the leadership and ultimately the whole church planting congregation. Um, the basic principles of the, the Word of God applied to our specific church plan. And the third thing we'll talk about is the prenatal development and birth process as we go through Sunday and Monday. So our basic training terminology is really important. So what we're talking about here, uh, these are the terms we'll be using. This is a unique training experience. Uh, we say in English, it's hot, yeah, hands-on training. So as we go through it, there will be a combination of uh, teaching and then a uh, workshop. And you'll be working almost as much in some of the sessions with the, in the workshop as you do listening. And so we're going to have a lot of things. That's what those pages in the back of your book are about. We'll keep referring back to those. There will be immediate application where you will be thinking through. If you're ready to plant a church, then you'll be thinking through that church plant during this weekend. If you're uh, thinking that you might plant a church in the future, you will be thinking about at least what it might be like. And we'll ask you to go through the process of thinking through how you might do it if you become a church planting leader. And then third, our, our last, uh, there will be an opportunity for immediate coaching as we uh, walk around the room and are able to interact with you, answer questions, uh, or just tell you, you really have a great understanding of what this is about. And we, we just, I just want to encourage you. So we'll have all of that as a possibility. There's another thing as we present, um, as we pre present things, I want you to feel free to talk. So ask questions, interrupt. If uh, June or Daniel or I are talking too much, stop us. We want to have conversation with you. And especially if there are things that we talk about that are either hard to understand or you don't think that it will be right for your situation, uh, let's talk about those things. We'll have conversations as we go through <clears throat> the uh, discussion. Um, so the basic training objectives are the following. One, we want to 
uh, sharpens your skills about church leadership and specifically church planting. And again, I mentioned already that statistics show that the percentage of successful healthy church plants increases with the use of the ABCs. So we will, um, uh, we use assessment to help people affirm that God is calling them to church planting. We use coaching to help them through the entire process. But this is one of the main uh, important things that we do, and that is to train. Why do we need to train for church planting? Doesn't the Holy Spirit just lead in a, in a process? For most of us who are planting churches in this era of church history, we haven't even seen a new church get developed that became healthy. We don't have a lot of examples around. And so we need to think about the process because for many of us, we haven't seen it. So we're going to sharpen skills and I hope expand dreams. Uh, you know what these pictures are? 1976, do you know what that is? What is it? it looks like a computer sort of that was the first model of the Apple computer the Apple one it was never sold commercially uh, it was just sort of an experimental development process the Apple II became the first computer that was sold commercially you know who the men are in the picture the founders of Apple, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Those two men had the dream. And when we look at, uh, this was made in 2016, this slide, uh, we see some kind of an instrument there. What is that? A current. Notebook made by Apple. The dreams were there in 76. The fulfillment of those dreams is still unfolding, but this is the current state of that. We're not just going to be talking about survival training, but health and growth training so that our churches will be healthy churches. And with even the goal, as the guys mentioned earlier, that we will have churches that actually plant churches. The goal of our church, I hope, will be believers that through their ministry, their evangelism ministry, produce new believers. That we have disciples that produce disciples. That we have equippers that produce other equippers that we have new ministries that become the, 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 um, the ground out of which new ministries will develop. And as we develop uh, new leaders uh, continuously, that we will have the ability to, to plant churches, churches that plant churches, disciples that produce disciples. Leaders that produce new leaders. Uh, ministries that are the, the ground from which new ministries will develop so that it will become more natural for us to plant churches because we are already multiplying stuff within the local church ministry. What is your question? What is the fruit? of an apple tree. What is the fruit of an apple tree? That's a very profound question. Yeah. What? I, 
<laughs> That's a profound answer. The fruit of an apple tree is not an apple. It's another apple tree. But that isn't even, you, you almost got it. You almost got it. An apple orchard. The fruit of an apple tree is an orchard. The fruit of the church is not just a new Christian or new Christians. Not just disciples or new disciples. It's a new church. But if we are effective in planting a new church, why not multiple churches? Why not begin to ask God to do what he did in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts, we find out that first it starts talking about they were adding believers daily. Eventually, it starts talking about they were multiplying believers in the various cities. So maybe, maybe God will open a door as he works in our lives and works through us as teams of people planting churches, that we can plant multiple churches. If we do, we're going to reach a lot more people out of the population of Slovakia than we ever dreamed was possible. The one church that, and I don't mean to steal your stories, June, but the one church that was planted in a remote province of the Philippines in a very Catholic province that was the least evangelized in the entire country, except for uh, a southern area that was under the, the uh, uh, what, the, the control, the control of Muslim of terrorist groups. In this place, seven years ago, a church was planted by a young church planter who uh, actually was uh, requested to leave his previous denomination because he was too biblical. He went through our assessment and tr a training, and he's currently being coached. He started a church in the, the small capital city, similar size to this city, actually. Um, he started a church, and he was an effective evangelist. He led quite a few people to Christ that came in to the church, and today is, that's 2010. 2011, the church actually got established. Um, it's 2017 today. Uh, what, what's happened there, June? There's more than 24, there are 24, is that the number? In that province, one church seven years ago, 24 churches and church plants today. Some of those church uh, churches that are there are starting outreaches from their churches now that are hoped and prayed, uh, they're praying that they will become church plants as well. This province was not evangelized. This province was under the control religiously and culturally by the, the Roman Catholic Church. And now there are 24 ministries going and a whole lot of people have become followers of Jesus in that process. Multiplied churches bring many multiplied Christians. 
Any questions or comments about things up to this point? Expanding our dreams. You might not dream of 24 churches coming out of yours at this point. But could you dream that we would plant a church in which one church came out of it? What are our dreams? We'll be talking a lot about the establishment of our dreams as a church. We're going to be having as a goal to achieve the dreams. There's a church in America that has kind of as its motto, uh, turning unbelievers into missionaries. And I kind of paraphrase that here, turning people who give no thought to Jesus today into effective servants of Jesus. Their commitment is to, is to not just be a good church, but to constantly see the transformation of people from unbelievers to servants of God, having their life impact the lives of others, turning unbelievers into missionaries. One of the goals of our seminar is that we will be trying to talk about principles as opposed to models. We will emphasize biblical principles and the application of those principles, which can produce a variety of church planting models, different kinds of churches. For example, depending on culture, depending on situation, depending on many things, depending on the giftedness of leaders and, and uh, the, uh, the place in which churches are, they take different forms. And out of these kinds of training events, we see the development of traditional evangelical churches, house churches, mall churches, churches that develop in shopping malls, especially in very hot countries where air conditioning is really, really, really important in people's lives and they don't have it in their home, why not start a church in a place that's cool on a very hot day? Uh, mega churches and others are using the principles that we're, we're learning. Most of us don't dream to become the pastor of a mega church. In America, that dream is too common because very few people are gifted to do that. But whatever the principles we use, um, I mean, the principles are the important thing. Are we living out the biblical principles of scripture and are we working with people uh, through loving relationships that carry with it a, a passion to help them become what God has created them to become. So we're going to talk much more about principles than models. So how this works, again, I told you, when we find this symbol with the little four uh, diamond-shaped rectangles, uh, there will usually be the initials beside it, M-A-P-A -A in Slovakia. Um, for us, it's M-A-P, which means that this will be an opportunity to produce a part of the ministry action plan that you will use later, which will lead to your church planting plan and by the end of Monday, when we're finished, we will assemble the map at the back of your book, or we'll just ask you to look at, look through it, and it will be the, the initial uh, 
starting draft of a church planting plan that you will live through over the first couple of years of the development of the church plant. Does that make sense? So we're going to have you do exercises that will be like the things that you will be doing as you develop the church plant, um, according to how God is leading you and how God has made you as the leader. What are the reasons for church planting? I'm not going farther than my assignment, am I on this? I don't have the, I think this is part of it. What are the reasons for church planting? Why start new churches? We need to establish a solid biblical and practical reasons for planting healthy, growing, reproducing churches. And a planter needs to answer the why question clearly before he can effectively recruit potential donors, core group members, core group, the initial group of leaders, of people that come together to form the church and team leaders. The first question is why? The most frequent question that I found are asked of church planters is, why do you want to plant a new church in this community? How will you answer this question? Why, if you're ready to plant a church and you're, you're going to begin, or you are in the beginning process, you can answer this question in reality now. If you think you might want to plant a church down the road, what would be your answer to this question? Why does there need to be a new church plant where I live or in the place where I live or in some new, new uh, place nearby? What are the reasons that you would give? Okay, a, a very obvious one. There is no church in that community. There is no gospel witness there. There is no opportunity for people either to come into uh, knowledge of Jesus or to grow up in him because there's no church. And then second uh, corollary to that is there aren't Christians there. Okay a pretty basic reason. Why else would you want to be involved in planting a new church? Okay, it is the best way to bring the gospel to new places, to grow new disciples, and to have more people come to know Jesus Christ in, in, a, in any place. In America, you know how I became a Christian? I was in, a, in a, uh, an athletic stadium, and a man came and preached the gospel there. And that man uh, drew that night in our city of less than 10,000 people, 25,000 of that football stadium. And hundreds of people went forward at the end of that meeting with a desire in their heart to get to know Jesus in a personal way. I was one of those. That man used to say all the time, as he was preaching his sermon, the Bible says, and when he said the Bible says and what it said, people in our culture would say, oh, I didn't know the Bible said that. I better listen. I better respond to that. So he says, the Bible said throughout his sermons, 
Later on in his ministry, he didn't preach that same way. He didn't say, the Bible says, because our culture had changed so much since the era of the 1970s, uh, the era of the, uh, the 60s and 70s, the era of uh, the Vietnam War, and so much of our culture changed. And now people say, oh, the Bible says that? That's interesting. I read a book the other day and it said something different. I read a philosopher and it said something different. So your opinion is pretty interesting, but they don't say, oh, the Bible says that? I'd better respond. And so um, we need to do other things than commonly have mass evangelism. And in our culture now, the way we do it is that we develop relationships with people. We serve people. And in the process of serving, get to know them. In our last church that we were a part of, I was uh, asked to uh, minister to people who were homeless in our city. And our church had developed a reputation of ministering to the people who were on the edges of our society, the homeless, the drug addicted, the broken people who were the product of terribly broken families, and sometimes people who had spent time in prison as a result of their behavior. And now they were in our town, and many of them were living on the street or living in poverty. And we opened our doors to them. And we gave them food. And we had free meals every Sunday. And people came in to our place and had a nice uh, Sunday lunch after our worship service was over. And we did something else that didn't just fill their stomachs or didn't just give them an opportunity to take some groceries home, some food home to their families. We made sure that we treated these people the same way that we treated each other in the church. So if somebody came into our meeting, we always had a Bible conversation as part of the, uh, the time together. So we would eat and we would just talk, get to know each other. Then we'd have a Bible conversation in which we talked about God and who he was and how we could relate to him and what his nature was and what Jesus did on the cross and all the things that would uh, be important in our messages. And sometimes people would come in and they would sit way in the back corner away from the table because they didn't want to get involved with us, but they wanted the food. And they would uh, get up as soon as we were getting ready for the Bible part, and they would head for the door. I tried to set a pattern. Whenever anybody did that, I would stop what I was saying to the rest of the group, run to the door, and say, thank you for coming and having lunch with us today. It was so good to have you here. We are really thankful that you came. Would you come back next week and have lunch with us again? And sometimes, not infrequently, they did. They came back, but they sat a little closer to the table. And we treated them like people. We honored them as human beings created in the image of God. Uh, 
people who were worthy of our time and attention and not just our food. And in honoring those people, eventually they came to the table and they sat and ate with us and maybe tolerated the Bible conversation. And sometimes they would ask the, you know, dumbest questions. And we would say, thank you for getting involved in our conversation today. That was an interesting question. And whether we could answer it or not, we treated them like people. And then, and then we, uh, we would notice, I would notice, that they would start to change. Some of them would say, could I come on Wednesdays and help with the grocery distribution here? Yeah, you can come. Uh, there's something for you to do. We'll have something. Could I? Uh, uh, and, and, and sometimes they began to ask good questions, you know, like real questions that led to a discussion of the gospel. And eventually people would say to me, one after the other, never uh, quote, led them to Christ, almost never, where we, where we had a time where we had a gospel booklet and pr they prayed to receive Christ, as was our usual method of evangelism in my history. They would come to me and say, Steve, I think I believe this. And I say, what did you believe? What do you believe? And they would give me the gospel. Clearly, I believe that Jesus died in my place on the cross. They would actually use those terms. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and won my justification. And I believe that. I believe that my sins are paid for. I say, do you really believe that? I say, yeah. Yeah, I do. I'd say, you're ready to be baptized, aren't you? And they became part, some of those people became leaders in our church. And I asked them what it was and later on. I would ask occasionally, what is it that attracted you to Jesus? They said this, Jesus gives me hope. And what they were saying was, he gives me hope about this life as well as after I die. Because people treated them like people. Church plants give us the opportunity to engage with people in a different way. They may not be the homeless. They may not be the hungry and the poor. They may just be people who are desperate without Jesus and need him, need him so much, but they just don't know it until they get to know you, until they get to know your people and respond.